There were six of them who were just baptized a few moments ago, and I have a good news and bad news for them. <laughs> oh, a message is there. I have good news for the five of them. They are now members of the kingdom of God. Just the five of them. <laughs> but I'm sorry for Richard. You are now a Filipino citizen, Richard. I had been in the ministry for the last 48 years, but this is one water baptism ministry that I will never forget. The background of this is so powerful that if you will hear the testimony of the family, even of one of them, like Pastor Johnson, you will cry. And so today, the kingdom of God happened in this place. Actually, the kingdom of God transpired a few days ago when each one of them accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives. The kingdom of God is very, very vibrant. It's so alive, it's so true, and it's real. Our text today is from the book of Luke, chapter 17, starting from verse 20 to verse 37. And the title of the message today is, Too Late a Question. Too Late a Question. Luke, chapter 17, verses 20 through 37. If you want mine, let us rise, please, and uh, read this text, text together. Together, please. Thank you. Shall we all be seated, please? The message is about the start of the kingdom of God. But in the Philippines, in Davao, the kingdom of Kiboloi ended last night. Because the kingdom of man is temporal. The kingdom of God is eternal. I guess we would have a better grasp of this text if we will go back to verse 11 of Luke chapter 17, 
which is about the ten lepers cleansed by Jesus Christ. So the story goes that as Jesus Christ was traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem, he was passing by a town between Galilee and Samaria. And in that village, there were ten leprous men. And they were calling to him to heal them, help them. Because they were excluded from society as a result of their physical condition. And so Jesus, being Jesus, the Savior, the healer, the great and mighty Lord, responded. And he said, yes, go, show yourself to the priest. And then as the men were walking, they found that they, they were healed. And so the Bible Father declares that the nine were so rejoicing that they continued going, walking to the, where the priests lived. But one of them, the Bible declares, a Samaritan, a man that was not only excluded because of his leprosy, but a man who was excluded because of her, his identity being a Samaritan. So he went back and he bowed down before the Lord Jesus Christ and thanked him for healing. And the Bible is very clear. He was a Samaritan. And Jesus Christ told him, your faith has made you well. The kingdom of God was in that very place, that very moment. And so as we go to verse 20, the question, as a result of what transpired in the early part of this chapter, the Pharisees ask Jesus Christ a question. And the question goes this way. When is the kingdom of God coming? When is the kingdom of God coming? It is said that the ancient Israel, there was this expectation that the kingdom of God would come with cosmic signs. Like a July 4th celebration. Like a New Year celebration. Like a fiesta in the Philippines where there's so much hopla. So much extravagance. So much rejoicing. Eating, merrymaking. And all. That represents the material world. So they were asking, when is the kingdom coming? And Jesus Christ responded simply, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God was within Sister Sheila. The kingdom of God was with brother uh, the husband. And the six of them. Because it is not about externals. It is not about sightings. It is about possession. It's about what is in the heart of men. Not the cosmic signs that the Jewish people were expecting in the coming of the kingdom of God. I was watching... Uh, uh, I was watching uh, a program and this uh, group was telling the, 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 the people that we are the true group because we have a large population. We have a large membership and they were showing the large membership and so we are the kingdom of God. But the truth of the matter is the kingdom of God was represented in this place today. 
Because it's not about numbers. It's not about what we see. It's about what is transpiring in the heart of a person. And so the Samaritan, he believed that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. So he came back and gratefully expressed what was in his heart. Someone said, it does not come in extraordinary way. The kingdom of God does not come in extraordinary way. And we people, we are always sensationalizing everything. Let's go to Tacoma the home because somebody great is going. With all the police sirens making noise along the way. But the coming of the kingdom of God is something that is within a, a heart, the heart of a man. Within your heart, in your midst, you saw the faith that heals that took place in the life of the Samaritan. Excluding because of his ethnicity and excluded because of his leprosy. But the kingdom of God was present on that very moment. Believers' lives, believers are already experiencing the kingdom of God in their lives. The kingdom of God is in us today. The kingdom of God is present in this place. In the book of Acts chapter 9, it is about the Apostle Paul who was planning to go to Damascus because he wants to persecute the believers in Damascus. He wants to destroy the ministry that was started in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The same ministry that was started here in FICF in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible declares that as he was walking towards Damascus, the Bible declares, a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? Notice the response of Paul. Who are you, Lord? What do you want me to do, Lord? That moment, in a split second, he was reminded of what the Old Testament prophesied. That a, a, a Messiah, a deliverer will come. And in that split second, when that light shone, and as he fell to the ground, he understood the implication that this is about his salvation. What do you want me to do, Lord? Who are you, Lord? He accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior of his life, a kingdom experience on the road to Damascus. Probably a dusty road. A hard experience, not based on cosmic sighting, unseen, but real. And Sister Sheila can tell you, when she accepted Jesus Christ, when she allowed herself to follow Jesus in water baptism, I cannot see anything material, but she knows in her heart that it's real. Because she went through the darkest tunnel I've never been. You've never been. And then God was there in the tunnel with her. Talk to her. She's a little bit shy. But if you talk with her, bring her to McDonald's. Everything will be an open. No, I'm just joking. She will do that to me, but not with you. A kingdom of God experience, a heartfelt experience, unseen, 
but is real. Another case in point is John chapter 1 verse 12. As many as believe in Jesus Christ, as many as accept, accept Jesus Christ as Lord, in the name of Jesus, he or she is given the right to become a child of God. And I would like to focus on the words name and right. Because the word name as used in John chapter 1 verse 12 is not the kind of usage that we do on a daily basis. Like I will say this is Kim. Kim who? Because in the Philippines, the name Juan is so popular. When you go to a com community looking for Juan, where is this where Juan lives? People will ask you, Juan who? Juan the Kawatan, the robber. Juan the thief. Juan who is... But John 112 uses the name in a very different way. Because in John 112, the name simply means the Lord of salvation. Accept and believe in the name of Jesus. And that is where the kingdom of God takes place. We cannot just baptize anybody because they want to go swimming in a cold place. They want to experience Antarctica. Richard, it is a difficult way to become a Filipino. It was a struggle. But thank God. There is one guy, Korean guy, who wants to become a Filipino. And then let us think of the word right. There's so much debate on, the, on, uh, on Facebook today about who is the right group in the Philippines. Sometimes it's based on numbers. Sometimes it's based on how big the church is, how much money the group has. But let us look at the word right. Right to become the children of God. Someone said, the legitimate entitlement to the position of children of God by believing. Seniors can become full members of God's family of the kingdom of God by believing in the Lord of salvation, which is the name Jesus. My knows that no matter how large the group is, no matter how big the edifice that they come and worship together, no matter how much money they have, like Kibuloy, their kingdom will always end in embarrassment, in shame. And so let us think of the kingdom of God. It has two phases, like a stage one and a stage two. Let us look at the present situation, the present state of the kingdom. Someone said the kingdom now is the presence of God, presence of God alongside earthly kingdoms. We have the kingdom of Jordan. We have the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Arabia. We have the kingdom of Thailand. We have the kingdom of England. We have the kingdom of ne Netherlands. Where they still have the kings, the queens that rules them. So many kingdoms. Alongside the kingdom of God. The believers in Thailand. The believers in Saudi, the believers in Australia, scattered all over the world. And the kingdom of God is among earthly kingdoms today, but eventually it will swallow up all kingdom, rival kingdoms. In the kingdom of God, in its 
final, final stage, there will be no more kingdom of Saudi Arabia. No more kingdom of Jordan. They will be swallowed by the kingdom of God. And if a person is proud to be a member of the kingdom of Jordan or the kingdom of Saudi, but not the kingdom of God, it is, it is a sad moment when that kingdom is wallowed by the kingdom of God. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, it talks about the future, the second stage of the kingdom of God. It says, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and shall reign forever and ever. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7. Forevermore, the throne of David which is the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ, will reign forever and ever without end. One Bible scholar said, this is an anticipation of the coming of Christ. When if I will just rely on my being a part of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, because there is so much construction going on, and the real, their money, the real has a bigger exchange rate in the Philippines. At the end of the day, I will be a loser because it will be swallowed by the kingdom of God. And so there, there, there are uh, requisites, qualities in the con con uh, constitution and the composition of the kingdom of God. There are three compositions in the kingdom of God. First, there has to be a king to rule. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It's about the Messiah. He is the king. He will be the king of this kingdom. Secondly, there has to be a people to be ruled by the king. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. When Joseph was, was not sure whether he will go on marrying Mary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Joseph, it is all right. It's nothing to be ashamed of. But when the baby will come, you will call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. They are the members of the kingdom of God. Some of them got saved in Saudi. Some of them got saved in uh, Nigeria. Some of them got saved in other places. But they will be the compos composition of the kingdom of God. A king to rule, Jesus Christ. People to be ruled, the believers. And a realm, a place where the ru ruler will as rain. John 14, 1. Jesus Christ told the believers when they realized that he was going somewhere, that he was leaving them behind, he said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back. And I will take you with me so that you will reign with me forever and ever. There is a place. I don't know how big the place is. But there is a place where his people will spend eternity. Then let's go to the second point. The simplicity of the signs. If the Pharisees were asking a sign... Jesus Christ made mention of a very simple sign, not the cosmic one, where proud humanity always desire to experience. 17, 25 to 30, 
After dealing with the Pharisees, Jesus turns to his disciples as to what of the given signs. First, he said, it is about my experience. It is about my experience, the suffering and the rejection. At this point in time, these things already transpired. When he, uh, when Joseph and Mary were going to Bethlehem to be registered, the Bible declares that there was no room for Jesus to be born except the manger. A rejection. Then he was targeted by Herod for murder because he would be a rival king to the kingdom of God. And so, Joseph and Mary were told by the angel, go live, go to Egypt to save the baby. And on a cold and dark night, they left for Egypt with the baby Jesus. Then when, when he was trying to do a ministry, people would say, yeah, he's nothing, he's just a carpenter's son. He's from Nazareth. What good thing can happen out of Nazareth? And so he was accused of being a part of the evil access because he was he was uh, he was um, uh, trying to cast evil. Finally, he was crucified, and then he rose from the grave. You know, guys, you don't have to look for a sign. It's already in the Word of God. It happened in the past. I don't need a cosmic sign. I don't need an upheaval of nature. Because it's in the Word of God. When He came with all of these burdens upon His shoulders, the kingdom of God has come into this place, into this world. And then, after this, Jesus Christ used the experience of Noah and Lot to remind people that at the end of the day, minus the kingdom of God in a person's life, it will be a disaster. In Romans, in, in, in Romans chapter 14, verse 7, for the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking, merrymaking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. But what happened during Noah's time? It was about drinking, about eating, about experiencing every human experience that is not within the righteous scope of God's divine plan. It's the abuse of things, the abuse of, uh, of one's life, abuse of the, 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 the things of this world, eating, drinking, merrymaking, like it's all, oh, it's again a New Year celebration. Extravagance, decorations representing, uh, representing the, the, the evil of this life. But you know, a decision has already been made by God. By, made by God. My spirit shall not strive with men forever. This is a question in uh, this is an answer to the question is it too late for Noah's people it
It is so great. And so we have come to destroy the city. And so an angel came and told Lot and family, leave. Because we have decided, God has decided to destroy the place. Without God's kingdom experience, the only end result, end zone of one's life is destruction. In Sodom and Gomorrah, rain, uh, God rained brimstone and fire because they were out of the righteousness of God's kingdom. It was for them just merrymaking, eating, drinking, marrying, planting, and just enjoying the things of this life. So my friend, brethren, the question is, are we all a part of that kingdom? Has that kingdom come in your midst already? Are you a part of that kingdom? Because if we or you or anybody is not a part of that kingdom, it is too late to be asking questions. Because the Bible declares it is appointed unto man, unto man to die once, and after that, the judgment. Only one life and it will pass. It's only what we have done in Jesus' name that we last. I told the group early before Pastor Johnson took over the doctrine class, baptism is nothing but identifying with the death of Jesus Christ. If we accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, we have to identify with his death because minus that identification, what we will be experiencing will be death, eternal life. Let us pray. Eternal God in heaven, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that today the kingdom of God was something to behold. Great to behold, Lord. And it is my prayer, dear Father, that may all of